Okay, so I will talk about uh, first food, foods and gut microbes. I have nothing to disclose. So first of all, why should we study the early life uh, gut microbiota? So during the recent decades, there's been a, a lot of uh, studies uh, linking the gut microbiota in early life to various uh, diseases or undernutrition uh, and obesity, but, uh, but also diseases like uh, asthma and allergies, inflammatory bowel diseases, and uh, autoimmune diseases like uh, type 1 diabetes. So when we're born, we're, we have very few microbes uh, in the gastrointestinal tract. But um, there's a rapid uh, increase in the number of uh, detected bacterial species in the gut uh, during the first years of life, as illustrated on the left graph. Uh, and this is uh, basically independent uh, of, the, of the population. Um, we also know that uh, this, uh, in particular, the first year of life is a very dynamic period in term, terms of the major microbial families uh, in the gut. So we know quite a bit about uh, how different factors are uh, affecting the, the, the microbiota. Uh, and uh, I've illustrated here two different uh, uh, cohorts and uh, examples of um, how different factors are affecting uh, the, the microbiota. And we can see from these that, that breastfeeding or whether you're breastfed, breastfed or formula fed is actually the, the factor that is uh, the most important for how your microbiota look in a, at least in infancy. Um, as illustrated by the, the pink bars on the left and uh, the, the deep red bar on the, on the right uh, side. But we can also see that at least in, a, in, a, in a mid or late infancy, uh, the, the introduction to solid foods is also uh, an important uh, determinant of uh, the microbiota composition. So why is it that, that breast milk is so important? So we know that uh, breast milk is uh, composed of uh, lactose and lipids, but the first mo most abundant uh, component is, uh, is uh, human milk oligosaccharides or HMOs. So whereas uh, lactose and, and lipids um, uh, either digested by the infant and, and, um, and absorbed, um, HMOs are, are passing through the gastrointestinal system uh, almost undigested. Um, but what, when they reach the colon, uh, they can serve as metabolic substrates for gut bacteria. And especially uh, specific bifidobacterium species has evolved um, strategies to utilize these uh, oligosaccharides um, for growth. And this is basically the, the explanation for, for why we see such a, a dominance of, of just a few bifidobacterium species in early life in the breastfed infant. So at some point, we, of course, are uh, transitioning away from, from, from the breastfeeding. And um, this transition from, from breastfeeding to, to family foods is uh, normally referred to as, as a complementary feeding period. And this typically covers the, the period from 6 to 24 months of age. This is a very interesting uh, period, uh, also in terms of the microbial development. As I pointed out earlier, this is a phase where we see a rapid increase in uh, the number of uh, different detected bacterial species in the gut, as illustrated on the graph. So, but what, what we don't know from this is actually whether this increase in bacterial species in the gut is just reflecting uh, an increased exposure to different microbes as, as the infant age and therefore uh, increased number of, of bacterial species in the gut, or whether there's actually um, an influence of, of the actual diet that we, that we eat. So to study this, um, we uh, looked into the SCOT uh, cohort. So the SCOT is the Danish uh, aberration for, for dietary habits and well-being of young children. It's a collaboration um, with uh, Kim fleischner Mikkelsen of uh, Copenhagen University. Uh, the study has the overall objective of investigating interactions between dietary habits, growth, and markers of lifestyle-related diseases during the first years of life. There are two uh, sub-cohorts, uh, SCOT1, which is uh, children of normal weight mothers, and SCOT2, which are children of obese mothers. These uh, infants and children are um, examined when they are 9, 18, and 36 months of age. We have a lot of 
uh, information uh, on these infants. And uh, I want to highlight that we uh, have validated dietary questionnaires, so we have detailed information about their diet. Uh, and we have, among other things, the fecal samples, where we, which we're using to, to look at the gut microbes. So in order to study this, this uh, complex diet, we divided the, the complementary diet into uh, 23 different food groups, as illustrated by the different uh, pictures here. And, and, and we can see the, the average intake uh, in the cohorts uh, on, in the table. So I want to emphasize, and this is at, at, at nine months of age, and I want to emphasize that this is a very interesting um, um, period. Uh, because some of the, the infants will have uh, almost or most of their their their, their diet still uh, covered uh, by uh, by milk, uh, formal milk or, or breast milk, um, but some of them may also have a more equal distribution of of of, uh, of milk based versus um, um, solid foods, and some may even be uh, completely uh, weaned at this at this age. So we have here a very nice range in the, in the, in the dietary intake between these, these different infants. Yes, and I'm highlighting here that, that milk-based, is, is, the diet is still quite milk-based at this point. So we took all of this uh, information about their diet and put that into a principal uh, component analysis as illustrated on the left graph. Uh, the way to read this this graph is um, one each, each single dot is a is a dietary um, um, dietary or diet of a, of one uh, individual at nine months of age. If two dots are very close to each other, it means that their diet uh, is very similar. If two dots are very far from each other, it means that uh, they ha have their very different dietary habits, basically. Then we uh, defined these two uh, axes, the x-axis PC1, um, which is explaining most of the variation in, in the diet. Um, we call that family food. And the reason why we call it family food is we can see that in the, in the loadings plot uh, on the right graph. Because here we can see on the left side of that graph that we have uh, breast milk formula and porridge intake. So this is typically um, food groups that are introduced early in complementary feeding, whereas on the other side of, of this, we have um, cheese products, pasta and rice, rye bread and meat, and ingredients that are a food, food stuff that are introduced later in, in, in the complementary feeding. So we also uh, defined the, the, the second uh, axis, uh, health conscious food, and the reason for this can also be found in the loadings. Uh, where we can see that uh, we have on the top potato, vegetables, fruit, and fish, and in the bottom we have uh, fast food and sweets, sweets and cake. So this basically is a is a parameter telling uh, how uh, health conscious uh, their food habits uh, are at this point. So if we compare the two sub cohorts on the, on the left graph, we can see that uh, the purple, which is the uh, children of uh, obese obese mothers, that they have a less healthy uh, composition of, of their diet, basically. Um, but we can also see on the, uh, on the family food parameter axis that, that we don't see a, a difference on average in, in how far they are in their complementary feeding. So then we, uh, we looked at how, how can, uh, can this affect the microbial population in, in the infant gut. So here we, we, we correlate the, this parameter, how far are you in, in your complementary uh, feeding, with the uh, two uh, major uh, microbial families of, uh, of the gut, Bifidobacteriaceae and Lagnospiraceae. So we could see that uh, the more progressed infants are in their complementary feeding, the less Bifidobacteria they would have uh, in their gut. And this is simply explained by the fact that uh, with uh, progression in, in, in complementary feeding, you would have less breast milk in, in the diet. And since bifidos are, are basically living off the, the, the HMOs in the milk, this explains why they are decreasing with, with complementary feeding. And vice versa, the, this diverse group of uh, lactobacteria, which are, are uh, bacteria that are 
are good at, at using uh, dietary fibers and uh, producing short chain fatty acids. Um, they are uh, increased um, as we progress uh, or the infants progress towards eating family foods. Then we looked uh, into how uh, both the macronutrient intake but also these um, different parameters uh, were affecting the, the diversity of, of the infant gut. So we could see that in both of these sub cohorts, there was a clear positive association between the protein intake and the fiber intake and the diversity uh, of the infant gut. Whereas the fat intake and the carbohydrate intake were not significantly associated with diversity. When we looked at, at the family food parameter, we could see that the more progressed these infants are in their complementary feeding, the higher diversity of the gut. And we could see a similar tendency for, for the parameter uh, health conscious food, that the more health oriented these infants uh, are eating, um, the higher is the diversity. So then we looked into the different individual uh, food groups and we could identify uh, rye bread intake, intake of meat and cheese products as those that were most significantly positive associated with the diversity. Vice versa, we could see that the breast milk intake was strongly negatively associated with the diversity. So this leads to our model for how to for what is going on the first years of life. Uh, so when we're exclusively breastfed, um, there's a strong dominance of the bifidobacteria due to the content of HMOs in, in the breast milk. But as we start eating uh, solid foods, this uh, abundance of bifidobacterium is, uh, is gradually uh, decreasing. Um, we also have, have a very uh, low diversity uh, microbiota in, in early life when we're breastfed due to the, the, dominance, the, the often dominance of a single or, or, or a few uh, bifidobacterium species. But this uh, rapidly increases as we progress in complementary feeding. We have a more diverse microbiota uh, and we have seen a, a bloom in, in the abundance of, of some of these more diverse families of, of, uh, of bacteria such as the lactobacillus. And this um, goes along with the increase in, in protein intake and fiber intake in the, in the diet and in our, in our particular cohorts, um, it seems to be driven by, by the che che uh, cheese and, uh, and meat products in the diet and, uh, and this rye bread uh, content. So what does this actually mean for, for the health of, uh, of the infants? Uh, the short answer is, uh, we don't know much about this this yet, but uh, there's been some some very nice uh, pioneering studies um, in um, in undernourished uh, Bangladeshi infants or toddlers. They have uh, shown that there's a, a clear immaturity in the gut microbiota of these uh, these individuals. Uh, so this basically means that their um, microbiota age is um, is much less than would be expected. Uh, uh, by looking at their actual uh, chronological age. They also, in a, this series of studies, identified um, that uh, this maturity of the gut is linked to growth and, and bone density. Um, and in, in animal studies, they could, could show that introduction of some of these species from this family of Lactospiraceae, which is increased with complementary feeding, that this was actually promoting uh, growth and, and bone density in, uh, in these uh, animal models. So then last year they went ahead and, and did an actual intervention study in, in uh, moder moderate uh, acute uh, malnutrition infants. Um, and in this study, they, 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 they then uh, randomized the infants to, to be in, in either of the four different uh, arms of, of a complementary um, food intake, uh, either a standard, um, complementary uh, feeding uh, regime uh, that's used to uh, to, uh, to treat uh, malnutrition infants, uh, or treat different uh, rationally designed so-called microbiota directed complementary foods. And these were selected basically based on on their ability in the, in animal models uh, to to stimulate the the uh, maturation process of the of the gut microbiota. 
so basically what they found was that um, if we look at the at the left left graph and, and on the top uh, we can see here the um, moderate acute malnutrition the infants uh, before in the green dot and then we can see what what happens when when they then uh, undergo this uh, intervention and basically the the only diet that that was shifting the configuration of the microbiota was the, the MDCF2 diet, which actually shifts the microbiota configuration towards that of, of healthy individuals from the same region with the same age. Um, and when they looked at the different bacterial species, they could actually see that the bifidobacteria, for example, were decreased, bifidobacterium longum, as illustrated on the top graph, uh, and two species. Uh, which are within the family of uh, Homunicocaceae and Lachnosporaceae were increased with, the, with this particular uh, type 2 uh, diet. And this quite nicely fit our observations in the, in the Danish uh, infants. So they also looked into the plasma proteome um, of, um, of the infants uh, in this intervention. And they could say, see that um, the proteome was shifting uh, towards that of, of healthy individuals. Um, and this was in terms of both uh, markers or proteins of, uh, involved in, uh, in bone development, but also central nervous system development, uh, and, uh, and a decrease in, in pro-inflammatory cytokines. So this brings me to my conclusions that uh, the infant gut microbiota is, is influenced by the type of, of milk feeding and, and the composition of the complementary diet. And we see that that the protein intake and the dietary fiber intake is coupled to, to an increased uh, diversity in this uh, complementary feeding period. Um, and, and we can then see that in, 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 in studies of uh, standard malnourished infants, that when, when you rationally design uh, complementary foods to target uh, the microbiota, um, we, can, we can sort of ensure a, a better maturation of, of the microbiota. And this could have an impact uh, on both growth, but also neuro, bone, and immune development. So, but what we need is, is much more uh, uh, research, many more studies on, on this, in particular looking at um, yeah. the gut microbiota and, 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 and detailed dietary um, registrations in, in, the, in, the, in the complementary feeding period, which is really lacking in order for us to understand this, these uh, interactions between uh, complementary foods, gut microbiota, and, and, um, and sub subsequent uh, health of the, of the infant. So with that, I want to um, thank uh, the, the people uh, involved in, the, in these studies. So my own research group at DTU uh, Food and um, our collaborators at Copenhagen University. And of course, last but not least, all the, the children and parents participating in the, in the Scott study. Thanks.